Good evening. I want to thank you uh, for joining us this evening as we take one of the very first steps uh, toward preparation of an environmental impact report for the district's draft wildfire protection and habitat improvement plan, which is a follow-up to our 1995 vegetation management plan. I'm Dane Anderson. I am the district's environmental services coordinator, and I will be managing the preparation of the EIR for the draft plan which is a required step before our board can take up the debate of the draft plan as has been drafted and have a conversation with among themselves and with the community about what is good, what is bad about the plan, what we like, what we don't like, and whether or not to adopt it and whether or not to implement it. And we'll, we'll touch on, on the, the basics of the plan in a few moments. Tonight we want to be sure that the EIR for this plan addresses all of the potential impacts that are of concern to the district and to you, the community. And a good way to do that is what we're doing tonight is to ask you for your input. We're here tonight to get your input on the scope of analysis that's going to be in the EIR. We're not here to discuss the pros and cons of the plan, but rather the potential effects that we need to analyze uh, to include in the environmental impact analysis. Your input's very important to us tonight uh, as we begin this effort. Now later, after the IR is complete, as I mentioned, our board of directors will be considering the plan. And it'll be at that point in time where the board and the community will be able to have a discussion about whether or not to move forward with the plan's implementation. So tonight, rather than your question, then being about your questions and our answers, tonight is about you telling us what potential impacts the plan's implementation could generate that we haven't yet identified. The district, together with our consultants, Panorama and Environmental, have uh, identified the need to prepare an environmental impact report. We've prepared an initial study, which is a very brief look at the plan, basic against the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act, to identify what analyses need to be accomplished as part of the environmental impact reporting process. The initial study, as I know, was a quick examination of the potential impacts, and from that, we developed a preliminary scope of analysis. Tonight, and the entire 30-day notice of preparation scoping period, is the opportunity for both agencies and the community to tell us what additional areas we need to beef up the analysis or actually add topical areas, if that's appropriate. Hopefully, you've all had a chance to review the draft plan uh, it's been available since, since August of this year, uh, as well as the initial study, so you have a, a good understanding of the analyses that are going to be done, at least as far as of tonight. Now, some of you may ask, what happened to the draft 2012 vegetation management plan? It's still here. It's the same document. The name has been changed to better reflect the plan's purpose and intent, as well as to avoid confusion with the 1995 plan. The draft plan addresses fire hazard reduction and biodiversity protection on the 22,000 acres of watershed and reservoir lands that the district owns and manages. And our overreaching goal is protection of our water supply. And with that, I'd like to introduce Nicholas Duar, who will be our facilitator tonight, and ask him to help us keep on track for the meeting. Thank you, Dane. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to start off by just going over the agenda with you. Uh, asking you what ground rules you want us to follow, and then talking a little bit about the, uh, the public comment period, which is going to be later in the meeting. So the agenda, we've already had the welcoming introduction from Dane. Um, then we're going to, we're doing the agenda review right now. We'll do the ground rules, but you can see that this will all be over with by um, about 10 past seven. We've got about five minutes to go. And then um, Tanya is going to give us a presentation about CEQA, the uh, WIPIT, the um, Wildfire Prevention and Habitat Improvement Program, and the whole concept of scoping, so we all know what we're doing here this evening. Then we're going into the public comment. So uh, by uh, 20, to, um, 20 to 8, we'll be turning our attention completely on you, and uh, I'll explain in more detail what, how that's going to work in a moment. Let's go to uh, the ground rules. Um, so, uh, I was lucky enough to facilitate a meeting of some of you in September 
And uh, those of you who were there in that meeting helped us to put together the rules that you would like me to help you to follow during this meeting. And that's where I want to go today. So uh, you have much more experience with meetings of, uh, of this group than I have. Please tell me what rules you would like me to help you to follow. Any rule that you'd like me to help you to follow. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, I have a question. I'd like Mr. Cronin to comment on whether, since this was a noticed meeting, and the Brown Act requires a quorum of the board to be present, and no members of the board are present, whether this meeting is legal. And I'd appreciate Thank the you. acting general manager to say whether it's legal. Would you like to do that or not? Oh. Would I like to do it? No, but I will. Uh, yeah, I just spoke with one of our board members who is unable to make it right now, which makes we have three, uh, four members now with David Bihar, uh, just as of November 10th, resigning because he moved. Uh, we have one board member in New York. We have actually two board members on the way that are stuck in a traffic jam in the East Bay right now. So what I'll do with staff is we will cancel uh, the actual board meeting. As all we did is notice this board meeting so the board members could attend. So we're not going to have the board meeting per se officially, but we do have everybody here and we're ready to take your comments. We could have had this meeting anyway to have your comments under this format. So because everybody took the time out, the precious time out to come here, let's continue and go that direction. Okay, and thank you for pointing that out, Mr. Rothman. I appreciate it. So um, now that we sorted out the Brown Act question, how about the, uh, the <coughs> ground rules that you'd like us to follow? Turn off phones. Turn off phones. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's already happening. So let's remember to do that. Yes, sir. Maybe we can just fight it out rather than speaking. <laughs> if that's what you all want, would anybody else like to just have a fight? <laughs> I'm afraid you're on your own. So that one won't wash. Well, I'll take them on. Yes, sir. <laughs> I think maybe we should try the opposite approach and try to be respectful. So uh, you want to be respectful. So try to open our, our mind so that we can understand, accept everybody else. So we've got two things there. The first is respect. <laughs> Let's talk about what being respectful would look like, because it's a bit hard for me to know just off the bat what that would look like. What would respectful look like? Would you like to follow up with that, or would you like to, would somebody else like to tell me what being respectful would, would look I like? I think one thing is to listen to people and let them finish their comments without it. So don't interrupt when people are making their comment. Listen to them. And um, and uh, you say you said the other side of it was was to be open-minded or something. I suppose there's no way we can enforce that. So maybe. <laughs> well, okay, that's fine. but it's a good thought. So um, listening uh, when others are speaking. Uh, what other, uh, what, what else would we put in to be respectful? Yes, ma'am. Not, not applauding. Not applauding. Okay, so uh, uh, not applauding, uh, the other... That creates tension. It, it could be, well, you know, not applauding, then the other thing would be sort of no booing or hissing. Essentially, don't respond to the person who's... This is a really good point because, because a lot of, I mean, plenty of, there's a lot of disagreement about what's going to be discussed this evening. And people need to feel that they can stand up here and say whatever they want to say and whatever they need to say without getting assaulted verbally by the rest of the room. So I think that that's probably a good idea. I mean, does that sound okay? No sort of hissing, booing, and, and applauding. Um, thank you. What, I think we're still on the sort of respect theme. Are there any other um, uh, issues around that? What would respect look like? No singing. No singing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no singing. Someone is singing outside. That's not singing. The acoustics in the parking lot. Yes, ma'am. People should limit their comments to a certain length so that everybody gets a chance. You know, we need to address that. We'll talk about that later in, in a moment. But it's certainly, we want to be as brief as possible. Uh, we'll talk when we're talking about the, the details of the public comment period about exactly how we're going to handle the time aspect because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, so thank you for mentioning that. Any other uh, rules that, yes, sir? Well, I was just curious if there was a way to establish the common ground that we all agree on. This isn't that kind of meeting. Um, it, it, we could have a meeting for that another day, maybe. <laughs> Talk to the district. <laughs> but um, uh, this, is, this is a meeting where we're, the district really wants to hear from you. You know, whatever point of view you have, it'll just be for one person after another. Given the time. But it's, an, it's, a, it's a good idea, definitely. Uh, other um, ideas for the ground rules? then let's see where we are. Turn off phones, be respectful, listen to others, don't interrupt, no booing, hissing, noise, or applause. 
um, and, and be brief, limit the time we take. I think we've got enough to start with, and there's plenty of room on the bottom of the sheet for us to add to it if we need to. Uh, so, let me talk for a moment about the public comment period, and then we'll go into the next thing. After Tanya has made her presentation, which is about a 25 minute presentation, we'll start the public comment period, and I'll talk about this in more detail just as we're about to begin it. Um, in order to speak, you need to fill in a speaker's card. You probably saw them as you came in. Uh, uh, I'll get a handful of them and pass and walk around with them uh, during the presentation. So if you have a speaker's card, if you, if you need a speaker's card to fill in, just raise your hand and wave at me and I'll pass it to you. If you have filled one in, uh, you can pass it out to me and I'll put it in the, in the box. Um, uh, people will be called, to, you'll be called to the microphone uh, by you know, the cards we picked out of the box and you'll be called up. Um, uh, we'll take as many oral comments as we can before 9.30. 9.30 is when this meeting ends. Uh, and um, I'll, we'll talk about more of the details when we get closer to doing that. So I think that's enough for the time being and we should go into the presentation time. Could, could we add a rule? Sorry? Could we add a rule that people use a microphone when they speak? Um, we only have one microphone, so they this, and all all um, uh, all members of the public who make comments will be using the microphone. Uh, because they'll be using the microphone, I won't have a microphone, so th th I can't follow that rule. But certainly, it's very important. We'll talk about this in a, in a moment. That when you're making your comment, you're speaking to the microphone. Make sure the court reporter can hear you uh, and get your stuff easily. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about the, about the, the, de the really the protocol of, of making the, the comments in a moment. We'll get to that. Go ahead. So good evening. Uh, my name is Tanya Trice. And I am a principal uh, with Panorama Environmental, and I'm also the project manager for Panorama, uh, preparing the environmental impact report, the CEQA document, for the Wildfire Protection and Habitat Improvement Plan, which we'll be calling the WIPIP through this presentation. So as Dane has previously stated, uh, the purpose of this meeting and the focus of this meeting is really going to be on the CEQA document and the environmental effects of the WIPIP. And what I've done is put together a presentation here that's going to talk a little bit about CEQA and the EIR process. And I'm going to give a brief overview of the WIPIP. And using my presentation, I'm hoping that this will help facilitate comments from the public um, regarding the scope of the document and the, um, and the potential effects of the, of, the, of the program on the environment. Uh, I'm going to give a brief overview of the WIPIP, but I just want to make a short disclaimer before I start. It's a very detailed uh, program, and it's been in development for several years, um, and so I'm not going to get into as much detail on what it entails and all the activities and how the program works in this presentation. That information has been presented back in September, which was about a month after the draft was release, released, and the draft is also available on the website. So if you are interested in learning more about the activities, the program, how the program would be implemented, what are these approaches that I'll talk about in the program, um, I do encourage you to go to the website and take a closer look at the uh, WIPIF document. Um, and then another important note, again, this is a little bit of a repeat of what Dane had said initially, but um, this, this meeting is uh, a scoping meeting for the EIR, it's not meant to accept comments on the merits of the project. It's meant for receiving comments to shape the analysis of the EIR that we're undertaking right now. And there will be, there will be meetings in the future after the environmental analysis where the merits of the project can be, um, can be discussed. So quickly, this is just the agenda of what I'm going to talk about tonight, um, CEQA, what is the environmental review? What is the purpose of CEQA and scoping? Again, a brief overview of the WIPIP. Uh, what, what we are envisioning as the scope of the EIR right now, and then we'll open the floor to comments. An overview of CEQA. Um, the district has prepared the draft WIPIP, and this is a draft. 
and uh, the approval of that document will be some point in the future. Before that document can be approved, um, it needs to be evaluated under the California Environmental Quality Act. Now again, this is a, a mandatory, necessary process because approval of the WIPIP is a discretionary action by a public agency. So this is why we're undertaking an EIR for this project. The, the goals of CEQA will be to look at, the, look at the project, look at the program, and evaluate what are the environmental effects using scientific data, using technical analysis, and then identifying what are, what are mitigations that could reduce these effects were this project to be approved and implemented. So again, the EIR will become a disclosure document. It's a document for the public, and it, it will be written in such a way that the public can understand what these effects are and understand how they're going to be reduced um, where that's possible. Uh, it's a disclosure document for the public in order to comment and to be involved in the process, but it's also a disclosure document for the approving body. So this will be, the EIR will be one tool that will be used by the board when they're looking to decide how should this program look? What are the effects? What are the benefits and the, um, and the costs of the program in deciding to approve the project? The EIR is not an approval of the project. It's a tool that evaluates what the environmental effects are and informs the decision maker. So the key elements of the EIR, um, this is a typical content for a, for a CEQA document, will be an executive summary, a project description, We'll have a section that talks about the environmental impacts, and there's several categories. We have these up on the wall up here, and I'll talk a little bit more about that further in my presentation. Um, we'll address the impacts, and we'll look at cumulative impacts as well as direct impacts of the project. It'll define mitigation, which is ways to reduce effects where effects could be significant. And, uh, and we'll also look at alternatives as required by CEQA. So CEQA requires looking at what are other ways that this, the objectives can be met that would reduce environmental effects. And alternatives is a great area where, pub, where the public can provide input and comments um, on the project, as well as the thresholds of significance. What do you think would be a significant effect on the environment? This graphic just shows the, the various the steps in the CEQA process. And as you can see, we're early in the process at this point. As Dana mentioned, we've released an initial study, and we're in the scoping phase right now. So this is one of a uh, few key points where the public gets to look at you know, what, what approach we're taking and what, um, what the analysis is looking like, and provide you know, what you think, what you, what you think should be addressed, what information you may have. So if you have information on, on scientific data that would be useful in informing the analysis, this is the time for you to participate and to provide that to us so we can consider it when preparing the environmental analysis. There will be other points of comment, so the draft will be released at some point, uh, probably early, mid next year, um, and then comments will be received on the draft document, uh, final will be prepared, and there will also be another public uh, input opportunity between the final and the certification of the EIR. So as I mentioned, um, I'm with Panorama Environmental, um, and we are CEQA and um, environmental consultants. This is uh, preparing documents like this is what we do as our career and as our business. Um, and so our job is really focused on working with the district to prepare a technical document that's based in science, it's unbiased, we have a team of experts who will be looking at each of these uh, criteria and impacts to the environment and presenting an analysis. And really, it's important to note that as the CEQA, environment, uh, CEQA consultant, uh, we're not an advocate for any particular decision. Our job is to present a scientific and thorough analysis of what the effects could be. I'm going to give a brief overview of the WIPIP. This is a document that we have not prepared. This was previously prepared. Many of you are familiar with it. Um, and the WIPIP was prepared by the district with the overarching goals and um, of their commitment to providing clean drinking water, safeguarding um, customers' health, homes and the environment of the community. Just to give a very brief overview of the, of the WIPIP, um, it was released, the draft WIPIP was released in August of 2012 after several years of planning. There were several points of public input um, in this plan and the draft is now available um, on the website and is what will be used for the basis of this environmental impact report. 
the objectives of the WIPIP are, as, as has been previously stated, the main objectives are to implement a plan that reduces fire hazards in the watershed and promotes um, and protects the biodiversity of the watershed. There are over 45,000 homes within two miles of the watershed, and this is an area of high fire risk, and we've seen in other parts of the state where fires can, um, can start and become out of control, so it's really important to implement um, some methods to try and reduce those risks. In terms of biodiversity, there's over 900 different plant species and 400 different animal species that call the watershed their home, and it's a biologically uh, sensitive area, so maintaining, um, maintaining vegetation and performing restoration plans are important in terms of promoting the biodiversity of the watershed. This is just a, um, a map, maybe a little hard to see, but it's, it's in the initial study, um, and you've probably seen this before. This is, these are the areas that the plan covers. So most of you are familiar with the Mount Tam watershed, but it also addresses district lands around the Cassio Reservoir and Suahui Reservoir. So the, the WIPIP identifies 37 different activities that are all uh, focused on fire hazard reduction and biodiversity management. And the fire, ha fire hazard reduction um, activities are focused mostly on the fuel break system. Much of the fuel break system has been constructed, but the plan identifies how to maintain that fuel break system and how to continue to, to build on that, on that fuel break system. And part of that includes um, vegetation management. In terms of biodiversity management, the plan identifies activities that should be undertaken to, um, by zone. And again, this, this gets fairly uh, detailed and it's, it's more information is provided in the plan in terms of what the zones are, what the strategies are for each zone and how to manage, um, manage the vegetation and the habitat within those zones. Um, but again, the, the biodiversity management activities are really focused on weed management, preservation, restoration activities, and also uh, to a degree will address sudden oak death and other forest diseases. Um, these haven't been addressed extensively in the draft, but because of more recent information, we are looking at it in the EIR, and when the draft is, if it is updated, it may include more information on how to treat sudden oak, oak death and other diseases. This is a graphic that just shows the zones. Uh, this is from the WIPIP. It's, um, again, it's, it's fairly detailed, but it just gives a, a sense of how the district is, how the watershed is divided into different zones, and each of those zones has different priorities and methods of, um, of management. So the, uh, these activities, um, most of these activities really do center around managing vegetation and uh, weed control. And the WIPIP has defined two different approaches to managing vegetation for both fire, uh, fire hazard reduction and for biodiversity management. And the first approach is a mechanical approach. So this is an approach that the EIR will address fully as, as a project or action, which does not include the use of conventional herbicides. So this approach looks at managing the vegetation using hand methods, mowing, pulling, uh, prescribed burning, um, organic herbicides, propane torching, um, goats are also included. It's a toolbox full of ways to manage the vegetation without using herbicides. And then the WIPIP also defines, and the EIR will also describe the environmental effects of a second approach, which includes all of the mechanical methods as well as the use of, of limited use of conventional herbicides. And so we know the use of herbicides is one of the greater, uh, greatest concerns of the community. Um, and where the WIPIP describes the use of herbicides under the second approach, it defines how they would be used. And the idea is that they would be used in a very controlled manner that um, follows the guidelines and best management practices methods to, to reduce the effects. And herbicides would initially be used to control, uh, to control leaf infestations, and once, uh, once those are under control, the idea would be to, to move to more mechanical methods to reduce the amount of herbicides that are being used. And again, the plan goes into much more detail in terms of 
where, um, where herbicides would be used under this approach, under this scenario, uh, how they would be used, the seasons of when they would be used, the, the amount that can be used, um, and, you know, and other legal restrictions as well for, for the use of those herbicides. <coughs> and an important note, the, the WIPIP does not include the use of Roundup. Um, however, it does include a, a, a herbicide with glyphosate, and that's Aquamaster. But I just wanted to make a clarification that it does not include use of Roundup. The WIPIP includes a toolbox of activities that can be used, again, to meet the objectives of fire hazard reduction and biodiversity preservation. And, uh, and it includes several different activities, 37 different activities. It wouldn't be possible to implement all of these activities, uh, given the budget and the constraints. So therefore, the actual implementation of the plan is constrained by the, the budget and the amount of work that can be done for the uh, for what's available in terms of funding. So the implementation of the WIPIP varies depending on whether approach one is used or approach two is, is uh, implemented. And the activities are prioritized. Again, the prioritization is based on protecting people, <coughs> protecting the habitat in the, in the watershed. The scope of the EIR, um, again, will entail a description of the, of the project, which is the WIPIP, and it will look at both of these approaches. And we're going to look at the environmental, the environmental analysis is going to equally look at what are the effects of approach one with no herbicides, uh, and what are the environmental effects of approach two, all the methods of approach one plus herbicides. So there will be a comparison in this document. It will be directly addressed of what are the effects of both of these approaches, again, to inform the decision maker, to inform the community, and to really give a clear comparison of what these programs look like if you use herbicides or if you don't. Uh, the EIR will address alternatives. Again, as I mentioned, this is a, a good area for public comment. What else can be done to achieve the objectives but um, and also reduce the environmental effects? As Dane had mentioned, we prepared an initial study. And again, it's a very high-level document that dials out uh, some of the areas where we know there won't be effects. Um, such as mineral resources or uh, population and housing. Um, and what it does is it focuses the analysis of the EIR on the areas where there will be effect. It allows us to create a document that's really focused on what are the concerns of this project and really specify what are the significance criteria, what would be considered a significant effect. These slides are um, just a summary table, and this is, this is a table that was a handout uh, at the front desk that summarizes what are the resource areas and what are the impacts and topics to be analyzed. So this, this doesn't give the significant effects, but it, it gives you a, an, an idea of where we're going with what we think could be significant effects, what will be studied, and what will be discussed in the EIR. We understand that one of the paramount concerns are going to be human health and safety, regarding herbicide use um, and, uh, and water quality, impacts to biological resources, both from the, both from the um, uh, use of herbicides as well as from the program in general and vegetation management in general. Air quality effects will be addressed. Um, recreation, aesthetics, cultural resources. This is a CEQA topic. It may be one that you might not have thought of as having effects, but uh, some of the activities that require ground cutting and, and off-road um, off usage could affect cultural resources. So we'll, we'll address um, what those effects could be and how to mitigate for any potential significant effects. So if you think that the, the initial study missed anything, again, this is a good time to provide comments. And what would be really helpful is if you can provide comments that are specific to what you think the environmental document should address that wasn't included in the initial study. So we have an example here, um, potential impacts on herbicide, of herbicides and spotted owl. Now this was in the initial study, but this is the, the type of comment that could be made. And you could state you know, why you think that might be a significant effect. So owls may eat prey that's, that are sprayed with vegetation and that could harm or kill an owl. This would be a, an example of a, of, a, of a good comment that's really helpful to us in terms of shaping our environmental document. So comments on the scope of the EIR, again, environmental topics, we've got these listed um, on the wall. Cumulative impacts 
is another area where, um, where you may have some comments. This is looking at not just the impacts of this project, but how the impacts of this project program would combine with uh, other projects or programs in the area, in the geographic area. And then also alternatives. So oral comments can be received tonight. We're going to very shortly set this um, <coughs> desk up and, and Nicholas will come back on to describe how the uh, receipt of oral comments will be, will be made. Um, written comments can be received, again, you can send by mail, you can send by email. If you want to handwrite, there's comment cards um, at the entry desk that you can, you can provide written comments tonight. Uh, and comments that are not provided tonight should be sent to Dane Anderson um, by mail, or you can email it to the address that's listed here. So now we're, we're going to get into comments, and Nicholas will come up and talk in a minute just about how this is going to work and how we're going to, to run the, the comment guidelines. We'll leave this slide up. Um, what this slide does is it's, it's, it's meant to help you shape your comments so that they're useful in terms of, this, of the scope of the EIR. So again, this is not a comment on the merits of the project, so it's not a, a, it's a meeting on the merits of the project. Um, so you want to try and sh to, to, to provide an effective comment, you want to try and shape it such that it's addressing one of these environmental areas and will help us in preparing what the analysis of the document. So we have an example here of what a merit comment might be. So the, and these are, again, these are just examples. They aren't based on anything we've received. It's just, a, just an, an example to illustrate um, our point here of what will be useful comments. So the um, Marin Water District shouldn't use toxic herbicides in the watershed where I hike. That would be a merit comment. That doesn't really help us shape what we need to analyze in the EIR. But a couple small changes to the comment, because I think we understand what your intent is, um, makes this into a very useful scoping comment. So the way that that type of a comment can be reworded would be, the EIR should evaluate the health effects of herbicide exposure from potential direct contact, such as through hiking. And on the right here, I've got an example of a bunch of uh, effective co uh, scoping comments. So I'll just read through them real quick. Um, the EIR should address water quality effects from use of herbicides. The EIR should cite a specific study, this is if you had a specific study in mind, regarding health impacts from herbicides. The EIR should address the health and envir environmental impacts of a spill of herbicide. The EIR should address greenhouse gas emissions from prescribed burning. Alternatives such as only mowing or using increased volunteers should be evaluated. Cumulative impacts on water quality from herbicide use by private landowners should be addressed. So these are just some examples. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Nicholas, but just one comment first. Um, when, when we start taking comments, and, and um, folks will come up to give their comments, one thing that we'll ask you to try and do, and again, you may not be able to, we'll help you out, is to first identify which of the categories your comment falls under. Um, and these are the categories for the environmental scope of, uh, of an EIR. And so we'd ask that you try and identify which category and then give your comment. And I think that'll help you shape your comment. It'll help us understand how that comment can um, be effective in shaping our EIR analysis. With that, I'll give it back to Nicholas. Thank you, Tanya. OK, we're going to rearrange this a little bit. Just slide this around so that when you come up here and make your comment, you'll be speaking directly. Thank you. Peter, come on down here and, and take Thank you, my kids. Time. Bedtimes, thank you. Um, I'm just going to read my comments to be as fast as possible. I love our watershed and all the plants and animals, humans included, that depend upon its rich resources. I, too, am concerned about the invasion of broom into native plant habitat and its tenacity. While I understand the challenges of safe and affordable broom pulling without scattering seeds, etc., and controlled burns and the limitations of goats and cutting, I am entirely against the proposed use of herbicides to control the broom. My concerns include, but are not limited to, the following. One, the possible toxic effects of chemicals on native plants and animals and on our water supply. So that was the health effect that she mentioned. Uh, two, the controversy of claims that glyphosate binds to soil and will not run off. 
and of claims that exposed to sun and chemicals, and I know this is about Roundup, but I know these claims are made about other chemicals, become inert because there are several studies that have found it otherwise. Um, the EPA generally tests only active ingredients in Roundup. This is glyphosate, and I don't know if that's the active ingredient in these preparations, but sometimes other components are actually more toxic than the active ingredient. In Roundup, that was the case with the surfactant being more toxic but not having been tested or named. Using herbicides in this instance sets a dangerous precedent for wildlife management, and I heard the lady say that the idea would be to stop after reducing the load of weeds of, of the French broom, but there's no guarantee, and it starts the, the practice. Uh, this is a very rich county, and I really think we can find a way to pay for volunteer management to get enough pullers, and I would even propose as a ratepayer myself that we look at how much it would cost to do this with no herbicides and to do it well with no herbicides, and we multiply it by the number of rate payers and we put it on our bill. I'm happy to pay it. I'd pay an extra $1,000 a year. I'd pay probably an unlimited amount um, to prevent herbicides from being used in my watershed, but I think when we multiplied it, it wouldn't be that much per, per family. And um, there's the cancer rate issue in, in uh, Marin and also the accident spill issue. And I, I could be wrong, but I vaguely remember that when they were using Roundup several years ago, and my girlfriend came down crying having seen them in hazmat cost uh, outfits, that they had had a spill up on the Indian Fire Road. It had happened, and they were trying to clean it up. Um, my son would like me to bring up a broom pulling machine and that's it. I think that we need to change what the budget constraints are, and I think that it should not. We should not be using herbicides. Thank you. Hi, I'm Debbie Friedman. I'm the co-chair of Moms Advocating Sustainability, or Mamas. And um, we, our goal as an organization is to see zero herbicides used around our watershed. We think that as a society, it's time for a shift in the way that we approach the use of chemicals. Um, and I had a lot prepared, but I will shorten it and go right to our specific requests. Um, the first one is that we would like to see human health and um, the protection of water quality as a specific goal. Right now, the goal is address wildfire, preserving and enhancing biological resources, restoring degraded habitats, and the ability to revise and review management decisions. And we request that the plan explicitly include a goal that um, protecting human health especially as it pertains to maintaining water quality for the residents of Marin County is of the highest priority, and that this goal be part of the analysis in the plan. Um, we also request that the plan create a 600 foot buffer zone around all the water in the watershed. The current buffer zone is 100 feet around the water, and we'd like to see it um, at 600 feet. We'd also like to see an increase in monitoring of the water. Um, we believe if glyphosates are used, then we need to measure it. Um, the, the monitoring that we suggest is that we measure the level of herbicides in the drinking water before any kind of spraying, during, and then after any applications as well. We think it's also appropriate to actually uh, measure the level of herbicides in uh, people's urine. I'm not sure exactly how that would take place, but it's a, a good measuring tool. Uh, we'd also like to see sample areas um, that are sprayed uh, be tested for mouth uh, or to be looked at to see if any malformations in animals um, occur in the areas that are sprayed. We'd also like to see a specific limit on the conventional herbic on any conventional herbicides used. Uh, we'd like to see zero, of course, but if it's not possible, then we believe that um, the allowed uh, herbicide should only be Aquamaster. There should be uh, no other herbicide allowed and then when necessary, competitor. And because there was a list of allowed herbicides and uh, we think there's too many on there. Um, and we'd also like to see a four-year eradication plan and limit the amount of herbicides used per plot of land during that four-year eradication plan. The current plan says they hope to um, use herbicides for about five years and then uh, stop using it, but there's nothing specific that requires that to happen. So we ask that if conventional herbicides are used, that they're never used more than four years, and that there's an eradication plan put in place to actually get rid of the weeds during that four-year period. And we also ask that 
during that four years that no more than seven pounds per acre of conventional herbicides may be used on a cumulative basis. So for example, if the first year, four pounds per acre was used of conventional herbicides, and the second year, two pounds per acre were used, then during years in three and four, only one pound cumulatively would be used. Um, and we'd like to see, we love the fact that there's untouched areas. Okay, I'm done. Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Paul Silva, and although many of you may know me as a professor of biology and environmental science at the College of Rennes, I'm speaking here tonight as an individual. And I realize that note taking is hard, so I've prepared, written down all my comments and I will submit them. <laughs> First of all, I commend the MMWD for its efforts to prevent further loss of bio biological diversity and to reduce the negative impacts of future large fires in the watershed. These efforts are essential to counteract decades of human interference in the natural ecosystems of the watershed. They are an important local initiative to address problems that are not only local, but also regional, national, and worldwide significance. Invasive species are one of the major threats to biological diversity. If our native species inhabiting the watershed are to be conserved, the invasive species must be controlled. The actions proposed for control of brooms and other weeds are good starting points, but they do not include evaluations of benefit and cost of elimination of all major stands of these weeds within the watershed. This is significant because both the populations of weeds and the cost of controlling them can be expected to increase exponentially in the future. Likewise, cumulative impacts of all threats to native species are also expected to increase exponentially. For these reasons, it would be useful to have estimates of the cost and benefits of reducing populations of weeds in all parts of the watershed to levels projected for zones one and two, using the different combinations of tools listed in the current proposals, without any dollar amount restrictions on the budget needed over the short term. This would allow calculations of opportunity costs or long-term advantages and disadvantages of investing different amounts of funds at different times in programs to preserve our biological diversity, a truly priceless heritage that we must pass on to future generations. Evaluations of effects of biological and chemical pollution should be clearly balanced. Impacts of invasive species should include not only threats to native species, but also effects on ecosystem functions, such as fire frequency and nutrient cycling. They should estimate the potential for trophic cascades as changes to the producers have repercussions higher up the food chains. They should consider the synergistic effects of the invasive species and other stressors such as global climate change. They should take into account regional, regional effects as changes to the local ecosystem impact migratory species that move outside the boundaries of the watershed. The effects of chemicals should include not only those of herbicides and surfactants, but also of others likely to be present on the watershed or come into contact with humans, such as MTBE, phthalates, and motor oil. Calculations of relative risks posed by all of these chemicals would help policymakers decide which are acceptable and which are not. Once again, the plan's process of calculating costs and benefits of actions to control particular invasive species on one part of Marin is a courageous attempt locally to deal with the problem of worldwide importance. Therefore, comparisons with efforts to meet similar challenges in other areas may prove illuminating. Thank you. My name is William Rockland, 14 Cliff Road, Belvedere. I ask that the EIR include the following. An evaluation of the cost advantages and safety from a pesticide danger exposure perspective of adopting the plan for weed control which MMWD's own consultant advised in 2009 and which would have cost an extra $850,000 which could have been, which can be raised by charging $1.10 per meter per month. And he made clear, Leonard Charles made clear the MMWD's own consultant, that that alternative, without pesticides, except for putting a little bit on the stumps of cut trees, that that alternative would, and I quote from his report, the MMWD report, this alternative would meet the goals and objectives related to fire hazard management, and again I quote, it would have the major advantage over the other alternatives of pre 
preserving uninvaded habitat from weed expansion. In other words, no pesticides, an extra dollar ten a month on the meter, and you wouldn't have to have pesticides and you wouldn't have a fire danger or any new involvement. Number two, an explanation, the AER actually includes an explanation of why the, the consultants do not feel that they cannot come to a conclusion about the safety of the pesticides because the EPA right now is doing a study on the endocrine disruptor effects and those results will not be available until 2022. And yet the report has to be, will be nine years before that, so how can they possibly evaluate the safety? Furthermore, I feel that you, the EIR must call for the employing of the services of a medical toxicologist to evaluate all medical toxicology research findings. The consultant who's mentioned in the RFP Susan Cagley has made it clear that she's completely unqualified to deal with medical toxicology. She made it clear by arranging for a medical toxicologist to handle that aspect when she was last asked to consult for the water district. Finally, and there are other aspects but I'll submit it in writing, evaluation of the significance for the possible spread of West Nile virus of the results of several studies between 2005 and 2012 by Dr. Rick Ralea of the University of Pittsburgh concerning glyphosate's harm to amphibians, which could lead to an outbreak of West Nile virus in Marin because amphibians would be killed. It's recognized that they kill tadpoles, etc. glyphosate kills them, and so they would no longer be available to eat the mosquito larvae. I'll, I'll stop here, and I'll submit the other things in writing. Thank you very much. I don't have any prepared statement to make, <clears throat> but I just would like to comment on the fact that, and I would like to see this incorporated into the EIR, uh, that I'm a part of the California Native Plant Society, as is Paul Da Silva, and we have been commenting for many years to MMWD about the huge uh, expansion of broom. Over the years, it has been shocking and it is a tremendous threat to our communities and I think that we cannot say that we can go out there and hand pick broom and think that maybe we have any likelihood of success. We have tried that for many years and it's been unsuccessful. This mountain is being overwhelmed by broom and uh, I think we have to face a very difficult choice. So I do hope that in the EIS they will look at the condition on the mountain 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, before the, uh, the, the uh, cuts were made along the fire road and so on to try to cut down the, uh, the uh, fire danger. It has increased the room hugely, so thank you. Thank you very much. You know, the one thing that we said we were going to do, which we haven't been doing, and that is Categorizing the, the, the comments that, that, that people make. Is there a, a category that you would? Um, biology. Biology. I'm David Curtis. Um, I'm, I haven't read the report yet, so I can't make specific comments. But um, I'll just say my predisposition is uh, if we can look at any mechanical means to uh, continue to attack it, and there's a huge um, it's an unemployment problem in the country right now, so um, there's a lot of folks that would be willing to do the work. Uh, my family uh, intentionally doesn't buy any of these chemical products. Uh, we don't want any of, any, any of the uh, toxicity. Uh, we don't want to add to it. I'm kind of shocked that it's still an option, and, and if we could scrub it from the scope, I'd be uh, really happy. Um, and just, I want to underscore my predisposition is uh, let's throw bodies at it and not uh, not toxic chemicals. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. I'm Ginger Saunders Mason, uh, Chairman and Director of the Pesticide Free Zone. Uh, under the uh, EIR, I would like to see under cultural resources and echo the previous uh, speaker having to do with full employment and to utilize people who are not presently employed to uh, do the removal, and also to use uh, cultured goats, ones that are uh, more behaved and will be uh, eating on the uh, uh, trees. Uh, 
But if you get a really good goat keeper, they do uh, take care of their goats and they keep them surrounded in the right pro area. And to remove the seed uh, possibility using uh, chickens or some other kind of seed eating animal. But there are alternatives in that respect um, that might be utilized. Also, uh, under soil and uh, geology, I'd like to see the scoping um, of the, any pesticide or any chemical that would be proposed for use uh, to be used uh, the full formulation, not the active ingredient, to be, uh, to be tested and to make sure uh, to see what the migration rate and the um, solubilities and the uh, movement of those chemicals would be through the soil in a time-related period, having to do also with um, heat and sun and uh, climate conditions at the time. Uh, my organization is definitely, uh, definitely against any kind of chemical applications um, and under human health hazards, looking at the uh, lowest possible uh, combination of contamination of the water supply and how it would affect uh, human health. Um, that, I think, definitely needs to be a part of the uh, scoping under human health hazards. Thank you. Hello, I have no fair remarks. <coughs> Pardon me, but I, some issues do occur to me in this process. Number one, um, I heard from the lady at the beginning that it looks as though uh, this is not an even playing field between the uh, natural methods against uh, herbicide, herbicide methods. <coughs> you sort of ruled it out because of budget matters. Well, if you start from that position, uh, you love it, really. I, what does budget have to do with this issue? I thought you were uh, going to look at the environmental effect. I heard you say something about fire, uh, control fire, having its own uh, environmental uh, problems. Oh, that's true. Too. But budget? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and I, I'm with the people who have said, uh, who have spoken to this issue quite eloquently here today. And the, th the only thing I'd leave you with, because uh, I really haven't studied this document in, in, in full, and when I do, I'll probably submit something in writing, but just this, that here we are, decades, I mean decades, after Rachel Carson, and we're having this discussion. Yeah. I mean, frankly, I don't know where you put that in your, your highly restrictive, uh, uh, sort of constrained uh, method of uh, receiving comments such as mine. Maybe it doesn't fit into your, uh, your model, but I really think we should look at the big picture here. And uh, people are very, very concerned. And yet we're, we're, we're proceeding under this illusion that somehow we have to discover, perhaps, maybe, sometime, somewhere, someone could be injured by chemicals. I mean, this is this is material for John Stewart's program. We've been through this for decades, and the country is uh, falling uh, over with with various diseases and cancers all over the place. And it's not just this particular group of uh, substances, of course. It is all around us. I've had several friends. Diet of uh, prostate cancer, tramping around golf courses, mostly. And uh, you don't have to tramp around golf courses to come in contact with some of these, some 30 chemicals that they use. And frankly, I'm sick and tired of seeing somebody with a total suit on spraying uh, poison in the cracks in the sidewalk. I mean, I think we have reached the level of insanity with this stuff. So that, that's it, that's all I have to say. Hi, my name is Sarah Spector, and I don't think I could really probably articulate um, any better what's been said than what everyone else has said so eloquently. I, I definitely want to throw my hat in for um, a medical toxicologist and you know um, the insanity vote. Um, 
But I, I also wanted to mention on a slightly, well, very, really, oh, and actually this comes under human health hazards, hydrology, water quality, recreation, land use, um, air quality, greenhouse gases, biology, uh, <laughs> agriculture, and forest, and mineral resources, health, population, housing, public, yeah, so pretty much everything. And um, the related issue of uh, fluoride in our water, which I know isn't supposed to be the subject at hand, but I have a close friend who's been trying to get fluoride out of our water for a long time, and she keeps being told that there aren't enough people who are against it. And of course, we know fluoride is rocket fuel, and I, I suspect most people here would prefer it not be in the water. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. For the record, my name is Lynn Feinerman. And uh, uh, my comments, I guess, come under, yes, uh, many, most of the headings up there, uh, human health hazards, biology, water quality, etc. cetera. Um, I would like to make a response and try to couch it in a way that it fits with the um, requests of the people who are formulating the EIR. Um, I am responding to the comment that um, working to clear French broom or whatever other weed is unsuccessful when you do it by hand. I just uh, shared a success party with a bunch of people in Tiburon who have cleared out the open space near the old church um, by hand and done it very successfully and uh, eliminated most of the French broom. So I would request that um, in the process of, of creating this EIR, that you do a thorough search for success stories with um, uh, hand, uh, the use of people's elbow grease, as they say, um, uh, rather than just presuming uh, by certain people's testimony that it doesn't work, because in fact, I have seen evidence that it works quite well. Um, the other thing is that I would uh, ask the um, EIR to formulate um, a way of paying people to do this work. Um, it doesn't have to be a great amount, but I don't think that, uh, I think that, you know, relying on volunteers is unrealistic in terms of the ecology economy equation, which has to be approached holistically. And um, the other thing I would request um, is that in formulating the EIR, that every member of the participating formulating group read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Thank you. After Tony. Merto Ash, forgive me. Uh, my category is biology, and I haven't yet read the report, but if it hasn't been looked into, uh, maybe for kind of the control of the invasive broom, uh, if we look at biological insects, I don't know, I know there are certain insects that feed specifically on broom, and in looking at that, then also uh, kind of evaluate how the use of the chemicals would then interfere and be counterproductive with that. That's it. Just Hi, um, I'm Mirto Ash. I'm a family doctor here in Marin. I'm also on the advisory board for MOMAS, Moms Advocating Sustainability. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about um, some of the trade-offs. I think we're trading off um, concerns, human health hazards, which fires are, of course, but also glyphosate is, as it turns out and also um, quality of life. And again, it's the same trade-off between um, the recreation and, and um, getting sick from the glyphosate. So glyphosate is quite toxic. One of the important things to realize is that um, the regulatory agencies have failed to protect us. It's very clear from the literature. And there's actually a study from just this past week um, that was published. And that shows exactly how some of the European regulatory agencies just um, systematically misinterpret what is in the studies that have already been done. So I don't know about the one that's being done for, in, in, you know, in 2022, but to me the, the data is in. Um, so the first thing to understand is these pesticides are endocrine, dis endocrine disruptors, and that unfortunately th this means they don't play by the rules of what we have known in the past to be toxic. So there is no, in fact, lower limit that's safe, and that makes it really hard to argue um, about is it okay to add more? Um, do we have to eliminate all of it? I mean, these are all things that we might want to think about. But 
Still, um, glyphosate disrupts the same biochemical pathway that's disrupted by the drug Accutane, and that's a critical pathway used by vitamin A, and the consequences of disrupting it are birth malformations. Um, Accutane users have a 30% rate of craniofacial, cardiovascular, thymic, and central nervous system malformations. Um, so I'm concerned that some of the cases that we see, we don't even know what the cause is, but in fact could be related to the fact that the glyphosate is out there uh, in round, as Roundup, but also as many other generic um, pesticides, uh, glyphosate. Um, there, um, the use of, you know, I've read some of the report, um, and it really did strike me that it seemed like a possibility that, in fact, some of it was going to be used. And so I started thinking about what would be a way to make this a win-win. And um, what I'm realizing is, for example, it's a graphic example at my house in San Rafael, they're spraying the median with hazmat suits and someone who has a backpack. I didn't even find out what he was spraying. And then a block away behind my house, which is right next to open space, there are people that are removing the broom by hand. So I don't want any glyphosate, and I want as little as possible. And if there was a way to get um, the water district to be involved in reducing the use of glyphosate, for example, by putting a warning in people's water bills so that people would know not to buy the stuff at the store and not to use it, we would be way ahead, I bet, compared to the amount of glyphosate that might be used by the water district on the broom. So that's one thought, that one possibility I thought would be a, a win-win for both of us. Uh, my name is Paul Sauter. I live in Woodacre, and I'd like to address uh, health and human hazards, biology, and mitigation. Um, I'd also like to provide some information from a study that the uh, Point Reyes National Seashore uh, Park Service just performed where they looked at uh, mechanical control burn and chemical treatment of groom. It's very informative, particularly with the protocols that they used on uh, chemical treatment. Uh, and the testing that they did to make sure that the water bodies remain um, completely uh, absent of glyphosate. Uh, second, I think that the EIR should discuss uh, particularly vectors of infestation. How does broom get transmitted? I don't think MMWD exists as a alone. You share a lot of border with private residences. You also share miles of border with Marin County open space. And to look at the water district in isolation, I think is is uh, inappropriate. Um, I worked with uh, Roger Buckholz to clear out a tank site on Upper Conifer, and it was clear that there was uh, scotch broom within that tank site, but not outside the fenced area except for one plant. Uh, the Park Service hypothesizes that seeds come in on their tire treads of their own trucks, so I think that the Water District should look at how things are getting transmitted into the Water District and how they transmit to other surrounding areas. Uh, next, I think that the objective of the EIR should have an end result of not only eradicated invasives, but leaving behind a healthy, sustainable uh, body of native species. I think there should be replanting of natives because if you clear out the invasives and don't put anything else in there, more invasives are likely to come in. Um, second or third, I think that the EIR should have quantitative and objective information. I don't think it's a good idea to say something was rejected because it's too expensive. I'd like there to be enough at, um, actual data in the, in the study so that we can uh, actually go in and look, work the numbers ourselves and make sure that nothing has been overlooked and that we understand how the conclusions were reached. Uh, next, I think that there should be, uh, in the EIR, a, a, a very vigorous uh, process for public notification of any um, chemicals that are used, any treatment, and time for the public to know before it's going to be used and what they can do to prevent it. Uh, and finally, I want to e uh, uh, I want to echo the, the, the folks who have said that it should not be budget driven. We should look at what's the best way to rid the water district of invasives and sustain and, and bring in that um, sustainable um, uh, uh, native species and look at budget driven as, as kind of a paragraph at the end to figure out what's the best thing to do in terms of solving the problem. Thank you. I'm Cindy Bradley, and um, by profession, I am a birth doula, which means that I support women during childbirth. And I want to speak to um, human health hazards, and I want to speak specifically 
about um, pregnant women and fetuses and <coughs> neonates, um, infants. Um, these chemicals are poisons, and while they affect all of us um, and affect our endocrine systems, um, the fetuses and neonates are particularly vulnerable. There is no safe level for putting these kinds of chemicals and poisons into our systems. This shouldn't even be on the table. We need to be protecting ourselves and we need to be protecting our babies. Um, it seems to me that what we've heard already in this room is testimony from a lot of people in the medical field who have the information that you need of the studies that will show you that we shouldn't be doing this. Um, we know this from Rachel Carson, but we also have experts within our community who can help you. So reach out to these experts. Let them direct you to the studies that are going to show you that there is no place in our watershed or in our homes or on our streets for these deadly poisons. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jack Berry and I'm here basically for mitigation. Uh, I've heard a lot of uh, good things about everything. Everything's great. The thing is, uh, the Water District has actually been doing a lot of work, hand pulling and what have you, but it hasn't been working. I grew up in Woodland and Fairfax and I've seen what happened. My backyard is completely full of room now because of spillover from Marin Municipal Water District land. I pull a lot of room in my time. I actually get paid to do it. And uh, everything's good. The goats are great, but they spread it by dispersing when they go to the bathroom. They spread it that way. Chickens will actually kill chickens if you let them eat it. So the thing I really want in the EIR is what's the toxicity of the plant? If you let it go unchecked, the seeds are grazing animals, can't go into it. Even if I'm around this stuff, I have to put on gloves because if I'm pulling it for a certain amount of time, I can actually feel, I feel a little bit different. So as far as this would be like being a firefighter and not being used, being able to use all your tools. I think if you limit this thing to not using herbicides, you'll never get a handle on it. And you know, I'm not a big advocate, advocate on toxicities or anything like that, but the thing is, everybody's overlooking what this plant is doing to, to the native habitat, the animals, quails. You see a lot of quails out in the wilderness these days in areas where there's broom? It's killing them. Did you realize that? And here, we can come in here and reinvent the wheel again, but why don't you go to, there's a, a right here, California Invasive Plant Council. Look it up on the internet. They've gone through case studies and case studies of all this stuff, and you can use herbicides. I use it very well. We cut our plant, we hit it with a dye, that's a herbicide, and hardly any contact at all with this stuff. Then we're out of there. We've been managing 120 acres, had five acres of broom on it. There's not one broom plant now six inches tall on that property. With minimal amount of damage, pulling the stuff, you're eroding. What happens is even, okay, I don't know if everybody knows about French broom, but trying to get this stuff in check, it's gonna to be tough. These seeds can last 30 years, okay, in the soil. The thing is, when you go pull it, what happens is it disturbs that seed bank. After you cut, pull, what have you, you disturb the seed bank, 40% of the seeds come around, and everybody knows how many seeds come out of this stuff, right? Between seven to 15,000 seeds per plant. So what's happening now is, when you're pulling this stuff, it actually spreads the seeds, it germinates them, so you're gonna have 40% the first year, 25% germination the second year. Then after that, you can probably start pulling it by hand, but just to, what's that? Your time's up. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I would like one of the scoping. I would like one of the yes, scoping sir. comments to be uh, the climate, because we have microclimates, and I've noticed that things should be done in dry season, and the dry season is very seasonable, and it varies within a day, and we have lots of uh, variations. <coughs> we have fog. We have sun, we have drizzle. So I think there should be uh, an analysis 
of the, the seasons and the impact of variation. I think that we should uh, realize that there is something in terms of aesthetic, uh, visual, using burn, large burn areas has a, an aesthetic uh, disadvantage and it was a Native American way to proceed but we now have uh, human impacts so that uh, is a consideration when you're talking about burn and another thing burns don't always work several times burn have uh, accelerated fires in uh, the southern Marin area now it's the very highest air where I live it's the very highest risk for fire and I noticed that one of the recommendations of the MMWD is just to use inundation uh, or re removal of hazard for, for fire but um, the cutting and the bringing in of equipment spreads there have been studies, uh, for example, the, um, oh, in Delaware County, they found that the use of equipment has to be done in dry weather, which we don't always have, because uh, it carries the uh, problem of, of seeds. And uh, another thing that is you talk about native species replanting. There's a good model right by the uh, Presidio and the uh, TGNRA where they take native plants, grow seeds, and have actual plants to transplant into areas immediately. So I think that that should be using that. Uh, there should be no planting, replanting, or encouragement of bay trees, which is a native, but because bay trees are the primary host for uh, sudden oak syndrome, that, and they are also a high fire risk, so I think bay trees should be removed completely. Thank you. All right, this is under agriculture. So uh, I, I uh, lease a ranch in wood acres with a few hundred acres and we were being inundated with um, scotch broom and it is toxic and it's it's uh it's wiping out uh, um the grazing and um and we try to pick it and we pay guys to pick it and it's so expensive you can't believe it and you and you wreck your back and the more you pick it it's like you said the more it comes up so you you um so to think that you can pick broom it's not true. It can't happen, and it won't happen. It's impossible. We, we, we have a piece of property in Fairfax. I've been picking broom on the same property for 30 years, and it's still coming up, so it's not going to happen. And, and I see what's going on. I, I'm out in the fields almost every day, and you can see it coming worse and worse and worse, and it's, just, it's really bad. And uh, something has to be done. I mean, I don't know what it's going to be, but... I, I thought of spraying molasses on the on it and making cattle start eating it, but you know it, it, it's bad. I don't know what to say. But whatever you guys are doing, I hope you come up with something good because um, we're really looking forward to something. I'm glad that you're on top of this or trying to get on top of it. Thank you. Uh, this is just a, 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 a very quick, small piece of good news. Two days ago, I was at this very lectern. Uh, presenting a proposal with a class I'm taking called the Environmental Forum of Marin. Phyllis is here as the founder. It's gone on for 40 years, so I'm in class 40, and midway through the course, by the way, you're all obviously very concerned about the environment. I would suggest you take a look at this class. It's a phenomenal experience once a week. It's been amazing. Um, but midway through the course, you're expected to put together some kind of proposal of environmental uh, advocacy. And so two days ago, I'm standing here putting my proposal out to the group, which is to organize, I run a, a youth leadership program, uh, to organize three to 500 teenagers in the end of February or early March to manually pick scotch and French brew in the watershed. I, I haven't gotten to the 
Park Service or the Water District yet, so this is this is this is a work in progress. But this is this is my proposal, and I've picked Brew myself. I know the frustrations, and I know it comes back. I guess we'll have to do it more than one year. Anyway, I just wanted to share that with you guys. Okay. Okay. I'm Kathy Strauss, and I really don't have any prepared remarks, but I did read the report, and I really want to commend the district for at least trying to move forward on this. And um, in terms of the environmental uh, impact report, um, I certainly would echo people's feelings about being very careful about using the pesticides and studying that. I think that's what an ERR report is for. <coughs> but additionally, I guess my main comments are under recreation, human health hazards, biology, maybe I'll restrict it to that. I am an avid hiker and I've been on the mountain at least four days a week for 35 years. Even when I'm working full time, that's what I would do. And I've watched the valiant efforts of the department to have um, goats pulling it, burning it, everything. And, you know, it's, I'm not a scientist, but it comes back worse. It's, there's whole trails that we can hardly get through. So in terms of a fire hazard and biodiversity, it breaks my heart after some of these pullings go and then you see wonderful things happening and within three or four years, it's gone. Um, so I think, I'm glad this is going on, so I hope the IR, EIR will look at what the real risks are in not doing this or not doing it adequately. Um, thank you. I have some scotch broom on my property and I have some quail. <laughs> but I was real surprised when the, the lady began by saying they're not going to use Roundup. This is a brand. In other words, they're planning on using these really human hazardous products and biologically hazardous for other creatures and for other um, growing things. The EPA says that that what sinks through the soil, and they say that, it, of course, the people that are selling it say, oh, no, 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 we have this other stuff that it won't go through, but it does. And it goes through into our water, and it will be with us for years. And it harms your kidneys and reproductive, which I don't have to worry about anymore. <laughs> uh, you kill the broom, but you kill other things. And you know, history has shown how we make big mistakes trying to deal with one thing and then screwing up a whole bunch of other things. I, I don't think so with the uh, poisons. Let's not do poisons. Some of you may know me as an individual, but I'm speaking here tonight as just a human in training. Um, <laughs> I'm not affiliated with any group. So uh, anyway, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who can get up here and cite facts and figures and actually like say, this does this and that does that, and here's this study and proves this. And people have talked about native habitat. <laughs> what is native habitat? There's natural habitat, but I don't think native habitat exists anymore. It's like, you know, is Costco a native habitat or a car's native habitat? There's all the pavement. I don't know what's native. I think broom is probably here, and anything that we spray on it to pull it out is probably going to do us more harm in the long run than just somehow making peace with it and trying to figure it out. Um, as for all that stuff and the merit and all that, I'm not going to try and reword my comments in my brain to fit into some kind of heartless brain box. I'm sorry. I re and I kind of resent the assumption that somehow there's no room for heart, or that there's just no room for... In a lot of ways, the whole problem with our society is there is no room for heart. It's all about dotting I's and crossing T's. And there's something else besides that that's being lost. Um, you can analyze the heck out of everything, put it in a paper, and you can prove it however you like, but when it comes right down to it at the end of the day, we're messing with things. We don't know what we're messing with. Um, MMWD's stated goal is protection of the water supply. And I suppose protection from or for what? Is cost more important than future health? 
I mean, I hear, trust us, we are experts. What are you guaranteeing? I've heard this before for cigarettes, for nuclear power and nuclear weapons, for asbestos, and chemical companies. How do we account for lung cancer, Fukushima, which is still spewing and teetering, the Gulf spill, etc., etc., etc.? Trust us, people say about glycophosphate or Roundup or whatever you want to call it. Okay, maybe you're not going to use Roundup, but you're calling it something else. It's still there. We don't know what all this stuff is doing. You know? Excuse me. History and events have proven that we can't contain this stuff. We don't know what we're doing. People have mentioned um, Rachel Carson and Silent Spring. It's like, it's all stupid. Um, chemical control may be less expensive up front, and who can guarantee the future costs in lives, in health, etc.? The intangibles, which do not show on a balance sheet, but are, however, the only thing that really matters in the end. I consider Roundup, glycosophosphate, or whatever you want to call this stuff, to be toxic, and I do not trust the experts who generally care more about money than the health and lives interconnected within nature. Spread some money, spend some money, and hire laborers or whatever. Learn to live with the drone. It's here. Ms. Frankie. Ms. Frankie. Ms. Frankie. Ms. Valerie Hood, I'm a living in Fairfax. Um, I'm interested in finding out if there's been a change in the soil pH and if that has any bearing on the spread of the invasive brooms. Um, Roundup has now been found in air samples all around the world in 80% of women and that it crosses the placental barrier. Um, Horse Hill is another example of successful removal of brooms by hand. Uh, the cancer rate is now is one out of three and approaching one out of two. Um, MMWD illegally sprayed Roundup on the watershed for five years that we know of. What were the great results? Were any, we don't have any more broom, so we know what happens after five years. That was under Paul Helfer's direction. I am assuming the results of that spray have been analyzed. I would like to see those results published in the, in the EIR. Um, has MMWD analyzed the French study by Sarah Lini that, re that examined the toxic effects of Roundup and glyphosate? It extended the study that Monsanto did using the exact same protocols. And under the Freedom of Information Act, they found that Monsanto had misrepresented the results. You can read that yourself, and I think that should be in the EIR as well. Um, <clears throat> in their two-year study, Monsanto did a less than three-month study, but in a two-year study, they found not only allergic reactions, but they found lots of different types of cancers and tumors including ovarian, testicular, as well as many others. Thank you. Frank Hager, president of the North Coast Rivers Alliance, 13 minute away, Fairfax. According to the California state law, a herbicide is a pesticide. The ER must include the history of French and Scott Broom, Scott's Broom in Marin and the MMWD watershed. Is Broom an invasive or an established species? Where and what nurseries in Marin sell Broom? How will broom be managed on the adjacent private properties? The EPA accepts pesticide manufacturer studies to determine whether or not a pesticide is safe. The pesticide manufacturers, like Monsanto, fund buildings and programs in our ag universities, like UC Davis, Cal Poly, and San Luis Obispo, and UC Riverside. Their pesticide studies are influenced by the corporate funders. The ERR's health and safety studies must be completely unbiased, third party, with no connection whatsoever to the pesticide industry. The EIR must address similar trial programs like the Laguna Foundation's Laguardia Eradication Program, which was funded by governmental agencies. Three years of pesticide use in the Laguna de Santa Rosa was a complete failure because they could not control the source. If you can't control the source, it doesn't matter how much pesticide you use, you accomplish nothing. Laguardia today is as bad as it was before they started using the pesticides up there in the Santa Rosa Plain. The ER must include a study of French of each proposed pesticide's impact on the individual species, including the fish, amphibians, birds, and mammals. The ER must address the impacts of each pesticide proposed on people of all ages, including infants and the elderly. Re report on what other water we need to report on what other water agencies use pesticides in their watershed. The district's public relations consultant has respawned the title to include wildfire protection. We should not have to choose between fire or poison. This new title means the ERA must now include a full study of the fire protection available to MMWD and response times. 
to the various zones, including engine types, either type one or three, where they are stationed, miles and drive times. The ERO must include the role of Mount Tam fire lookout, time of, of a smoke spot, to dispatch to arrival of the first engine. It must also include <coughs> excuse me, dispatch process to order air tankers and a flight time from Air Co. Base at Sonoma County Airport to Mount Tam. The ERO must address the new CAL FIRE fire fee on unincorporated properties, as those fees can only be used for prevention. Hand mechanical, hand and mechanical pulling of room fits that criteria. Thank you very much. Hello. I, yeah, I'm Conrad Williams. I, I don't have prepared things, but I, I did look up on the, the internet about using goats, and I found some very interesting things. I, they said that they eat the green things, and uh, they can consume about seven to nine pounds of green per goat, and, and they leave the stems completely done, which means the plants can't go on. And it's my contention that if a person had a planned program to use the goats in the right seasons, you wouldn't have a proliferation of the, of the broom. I, 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 uh, I'm kind of wondering, that because Mr. Egger mentioned he didn't know about anybody who sold broom, but I've heard that broom was actually sold in Novalia Nurseries uh, because it was this beautiful plant when it first started. And they spread because it somehow spread over the, the. That may be true or not, but I think if a person had a planned program that uh, wasn't just part of this and part of that and part of that, because you mentioned when you did the goats and you did the pulling and you did the, the digging and you did the something else, you know, it, instead of having a thing that plans over the years to really help. The, uh, the environment and make it uh, something that we can all live with. And I, I've, I've hiked all over the mountain and, and I've seen this stuff come back and come back and come back. And you, I've seen the little seeds that shoot out about, you know, what, eight, ten feet, you know, and with the fire, that there are little fire, fireballs that can go shooting out. They're terrible for spreading fire. But if you get them before the seeds are ripe, they're not going to reproduce. If you get the leaves off, the plants aren't going to make anything. I think it takes good planning and good uh, uh, detailed plans to make to have a program that works rather than trying to do this and that and the other thing and, and uh, let's get rid of it all and just spread the poisons all over the land and that'll still solve everything. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dale Comb. I'm in Mill Valley. I'm going to be very short. Um, I come at this, I'm sure a lot of people in this room also. Uh, I am a home gardener. I grow things hydroponically and organically. I'm also a hiker. I love to hike in Marin County and Sonoma. So the safety and the health issues of having a safe water supply is of grave concern to me. I come here because this past Monday, I attended a workshop in Santa Clara, California at the convention center where a MIT scientist, Dr. Stephanie Seneff, specifically talked about the health risks of glyphosate. That was what she said. And I brought one page from that uh, event because I couldn't remember everything that she said here. But I brought here as a recapitulation of what her talk was all about and why it's a risk. And here's what she said. Glyphosate is the dominant weed killer in the United States and increasingly in the world. It also kills the good bacteria in the soil. Glyphosate also disturbs gut bacteria and leads to fertility problems in cattle. I know this was mentioned earlier. Glyphosate helates important nutrients like iron, manganese, and zinc. And she also mentioned the French experiment about the tumors and all the other different problems related to Roundup and glyphosate. For any additional information, if you want to know the dangers of glyphosate, I recommend that you see a couple of movies that are available online. One is Seeds of Freedom, which you can go to seedsoffreedom.info, or Genetic Roulette genetic or you can find it on uh, YouTube. Thank you very much.
Would you, would you know how to spell the name of the Sure. Dr. Seneff, her last name is spelled S-E-N-E-F-F. -E -F -F. And she's with MIT. My name is Robert Ernst. I live in, uh, I'm sure I blame the Sun Valley. Um, <clears throat> I was born in a small farm in Iowa and uh, saw early pesticide use and uh, prior gentleman's statement about uh, destroying topsoil is a good one. And true, I think that it's been a tremendous education for me here to hear about the specifics uh, uh, of the situation. And uh, I think uh, you might be well advised to put a round ta table together with some of these uh, folks here, both pro and con, those of you who struggled with the situation, and um, and to come uh, to come to a find another conclusion. I don't think uh, uh, I just don't think pesticides are the answer. I saw a uh, commercial from an early TV series the other night, uh, Jack Webb, uh, and uh, he was uh, smoking a Chesterfield cigarette during the commercial and he said, I'm happy to announce without a doubt that we just had an independent study done by the Surgeon General and uh, Chesterfield is the first tobacco company to say there's absolutely no internal harm <laughs> with this cigarette right here. And Chesterfield's the first one to do it. We're accountable for it, we can guarantee it. Uh, well, you know the outcome to that. So, I think it bears investigation, and as the doctor, good doctor said, I think you've got to wait till 2022 to actually know whether it's going to harm you or not. And I, uh, everybody else has listed the endless number of events that have happened uh, because we rushed to satisfy immediate needs instead of long-term goals, I think. Hi, I just want to thank everyone for all the homework and research that everyone's done. I just found out about this yesterday, and I'm a new resident of temporary status. And uh, But I studied environmental and biological science like 30 years ago in Canada, and I've watched us go through all these changes and keep going. Money versus health. Money versus life. And it's just like we have to make a stop on some level. And so I, I had all these things to talk about, and then when I realized it's like, what we're talking about, the problem is really the seeds. The seeds are the problem. And they're finite. They're actually not infinite. So if you can stop, like the gentleman was saying earlier, if you can actually stop the seed production, which you can do through cutting manually, all the money that's being spent on the, the company, you know, tens of thousands of dollars could be used in that, has to be cut. And then it's probably better to pull the plant to actually initiate the growth to pull them forward because the conditions are optimal for those plants to invade again. And you have to do that continuously, rigorously, for a period of time. And it will stop because it's a finite number. You have to keep the seeds from coming. And that, you can do that. There's no reason why we have to go to GPs and use that. So I really encourage you, all of you to tell your friends and really bring the support out because it's our life and our water. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'm Silva Jane from Lucas Valley, and um, a very brief <coughs> statement from the Sierra Club Marine Group. We oppose the use of glyphosate in the watershed. We encourage more extensive use of non-toxic methods to achieve these goals. So that was from, that's my official statement. And personally, I am shocked that, that we're having this conversation. I salute the people who have come before me and uh, quoted the, the various um, issues. And of course, I also recognize that a lot of effort has been made by MMWD. It has not been enough in the right direction, in the smart direction. The, the woman who spoke just a moment ago, uh, there are, it is finite, it can be done, but it's year after year after year, it has to be done, and uh, we also have to find and get to various sources. Uh, and the, the speaking of sources, the seeds are going to continue to blow in from here and there or be tracked in. It's a continual effort, but it's a matter of management, proper management, and eventually it will be under control. We're not going to get rid of it. It's, it's part of our heritage right now, but we can manage it and we cannot manage the toxic effects of these chemicals. And to, to trust studies by uh, Monsanto and Monsanto uh, sponsored people is ridiculous. Uh, one example, um, 
is we know that bees are affected by toxics. Monsanto purchased the company that the, the, that does the most um, the, the most advanced studies on the effects of bees. So it was uh, on the toxic effects on bees. Now, and Monsanto bought the company. So I am very skeptical of, of uh, research that's based on um, some of some of our, the sources of from Monsanto and their paper they sponsor. That's per my personal comment. Thank you. I hate speaking. Um, I find it disturbing that the stated goals of the EIR do not mention human health. There are three goals. Not a human is mentioned in there. Uh, I think that we need to be concerned both about the water users and the recreational users of the land. Um, I think that potential human health hazards are paramount importance, especially to those most vulnerable, including children. Um, and people with extra high sensitivities. I think that we should be using the precautionary principle in terms of use of any kind of chemicals. Um, I'm concerned about the long-term accumulation and concentration of herbicides, even in small amounts. As someone mentioned before, they don't go away. Um, and they do kill the beneficial microorganisms in the soil. Um, I'm also concerned about creating super weeds by the repeated application of pests of herbicides. I'm so, as you may guess, I'm totally opposed to the use of all herbicides because um, I don't think any amount is safe. Um, I'm concerned about the effects on migratory animals. I didn't, from what I've read, which is very brief, um, I didn't see migratory animals, just local animals mentioned. I'm concerned about um, cancer rates and uh, the water district's liability uh, because, for example, glyphosate, which has been mentioned a number of times, is linked to breast cancer, and as we all know, Warren County is extremely, uh, has extremely high rates of breast cancer. Um, I think volunteers should be used more, and I think people should be educated more about the issues um, with brooms, specifically with fire hazards, specifically. I mean, my parents, who also are Warren County residents, I think broom is a beautiful plant. Um, they don't get it. Um, so I think that there needs to be more education about what the problems are. I personally have participated in and seen success both in family land and on public land of um, controlling broom. Uh, I think that we need an integrated vegetation management, holistic management approach that includes the collecting of flowers and seeds um, off the plants. I mean, some great comments were made about how the plants, uh, how the seeds are dispersed. Um, their soil that is disturbed seems to be particularly vulnerable and needs to be, that, you know, kind of the, let's put that in a management plan where we think about, okay, we've done, an egg, we've widened the fire trail for a uh, fire break, but we've just disturbed a 10 foot wide swath, well, we better be looking at that and pulling up the little stuff as it comes up. Um, and I think the options are loaded because you have the, the option with and the option without when you have everything plus one, even if it has a minimal effect, that makes it seem better. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jill Robinson. I've been a resident of Corte Madeira for about 23 years. Um, I myself am chemically injured. Uh, my family used a lot of pesticides and herbicides in Alabama. And um, I'd, I'd much rather be around scotch broom. I'm not afraid of the toxicity of scotch broom as I am of herbicides. Um, I'm here to talk about human health hazards and I also cannot believe that this is on the table. I, I love living in Marin County. My 10-year-old son grounds me here, but I won't live here if, if this happens. I don't know where I'm gonna go. Um, I just found out about this meeting yesterday also. And you're asking for resources. I just went on the internet in five minutes. I have this article that's very frightening about 
glyphosates. Um, but I would also urge you to talk to my friend Paul Transby Towers at Pesticide Action Network, which is right over there in Oakland. And they have great alternatives and great information. Easy. Environmental Working Group is in San Francisco. They, they've published a lot about the harm that can come from glyphosates. So I'm going to just hit you with some of the science I found here, some of the facts. Um, glyphosate is number one as the cause of injuries among health, uh, among um, agricultural workers. Studies of farmers and other people exposed to glyphosate herbicides have shown that this exposure is linked with increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, miscarriages, and ADD. Um, one out of 10 children has ADHD, by the way. Um, one in 54 boys has autism, and I think maybe more than that in this county. Um, for each of these hazards identified in these studies, there are also laboratory studies with results that are consistent with the studies of exposed people. Studies of glyphosate contamination of water are limited, but results indicate that it can commonly contaminate streams in both agri agricultural and urban areas. And I'm going to read a little thing about contamination of water. Glyphosate is not included, or it wasn't at the time of this study, and it's a few years old. Is not this paper, not included among the pesticides being studied by the U.S. Geological Survey's National Water Quality Assessment Program. So there are no comprehensive national statistics about contamination of rivers and streams. A regional study, however, indicates glyphosate can be a common contaminant. Um, in a USGS Toxic Substances Hydrology Program survey of Midwest streams, glyphosate was found in over a third of the samples collected the primary breakdown product of glyphosate was found in over two-thirds of the samples. The study also showed that glyphosate contaminated water from spring through fall and described, described glyphosate samples taken at Harvest Town as unexpected. Researchers had presumed it would degrade by the, the late growing system. Use of glyphosate herbicides has also been linked to increased problems with a variety of other plant diseases. So when we're talking about our natives, we should think about that. And one more thing for my friend here who's too shy to come up. Um, the you know, mid a few minutes, but you say a few I was just going to take a second. Um, you know, we have to get haircuts every six weeks. The schools, the middle schools and high schools, are, are desperate to get volunteer programs to get kids out to do this work. Kids can do this work. Uh, hi there. The number one priority of the Marin Municipal Water District <clears throat> is water quality. If the board adopts the use of toxic herbicides outlined, <clears throat> excuse me, in the draft plan, it will not only betray that priority, it's going to set into motion a scientifically dubious model of species eradication, which is going to be costly to the district and to the health of our community. While MMWD's watershed has been designated as a UNESCO biosphere, that does not mean that it needs to attempt to preserve it as a biological museum. What UNESCO actually encourages is innovative management of these biospheres. And as we've all seen from the historic photos of Marin, the landscape of our community has changed significantly over the last hundred years. And it's going to continue to change no matter what we do. Broom has been in, in this area for 100 years, and it's a well-established species. And I question the validity of the recommendation for broom elimination by either organic or pesticide use. The draft plan has not surveyed the hundreds of private and public properties surrounding the watershed for infestation of broom and other noxious weeds. The seeds of the broom last for decades and can be carried by wind, rain, and animals. Such transmission does not recognize boundaries and is sure to restart the growth of the unwanted invasive in a short, in a short period of time. By declaring a war on weeds, isn't the district setting an unrealistic goal which will justify the endless expansion and escalation as we've seen with the so-called war on terror? I think what we need to do is concentrate on the things that we know will succeed in managing the problem, prioritizing completion of the fuel brake system, mowing and clearing broom stands to reduce fuel load, working with the Bay Area uh, Air Quality District 
to permit controlled burns on the worst areas in, of infestation. Let's do what we know will work and not pursue pesticides. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Fairfax, and I want to say that I'm incredibly proud to live in Marin, and I'm proud of the people that came here um, for speaking on behalf of themselves and the future and the other people that cannot be here. Um, I work in trauma. I help people recover from uh, really challenging experiences and the impact of drugs and the impact of, well, there's all kinds of trauma in the world we know about it. Um, but I specialize in babies and um, pregnant moms. And the impact is significant and it's hard enough already in the world. We're talking about water and we're talking about chemicals. Um, there's also uh, GMOs and pesticides, and there's also electromagnetic fields and radio frequencies, and all these things that is making it incredibly hard for um, a healthy child, a healthy baby, a healthy embryo to actually make its way through. Um, and after listening to everybody, it's very clear that this is a challenging situation. Um, I personally would like to see pesticides off the table. And I don't know you're enough about your process, and I don't know if you have a deadline for yourselves in terms of taking action, but I actually would recommend spending a little bit more time in that place of helplessness and in that experience of we don't know what to do, uh, rather than rushing to take a course of action that looks like we'll solve some problem that we're looking at in a very minuscule way, in a very focused way. So, it's really worth taking the time to do this in such a way where we are not introducing more harm to the people in this county. And we also need to set a precedent, because other people are watching we're in, and we already know from history that what we do here sets a precedent 10 years down the line for everybody else. So, thank you. Hugo Landegger, uh, this is under biology. Uh, room's got to go, and uh, one thing I want to tell you is I'm head of San Rafael Group, and I deal with uh, homeless issues in San Rafael. There's a huge workforce, potential workforce there that I'd like to see MMWD take advantage of. We have 250 homeless people in our downtown that, for the most part, are sitting around all day waiting for the next handout. They need to be put to work, and they don't even need to be paid. You just send a bus down to downtown. If they're sober, they get on the bus, take them over to, to uh, uh, your lands, and let them start clearing French broom. I'm an advocate for hand pulling. Uh, I believe it does work. There's methods to it, and I'm not too sure MMWD, when they uh, use volunteers to pull French broom, are doing it in the correct manner. I want to tell you one other thing. French Broom's been with us for many years. Uh, not too long ago, I pulled them. I think it was the mother of all French Broom plants. I counted the annual rings, 92. Thank you. My name is Gene Berensmeyer. I live uh, in the San Geronimo Valley. I didn't prepare a lot of remarks, and I hope I don't ramble. When you get older, you start to ramble. But I came and discovered the San Geronimo Valley in 1953. And at that time, and shortly after, I had my son, and I walked every trail in San Geronimo Valley and every ridge. I loved the native plants, and I loved the wildlife. I set about helping to preserve our community so it wasn't a huge population with a large number of houses and houses on the ridges, and I became a uh, I got on the Parks and Open Space Commission for 20 years, and it was instrumental in getting a lot of open space. In 1995, I was in a helicopter from Sausalito to look at a development of 1,600 acres of San Geronimo Valley that wrapped around every village up to San Geronimo Ridge. And as we flew over TAM, I was absolutely stunned at the broom. It was beautiful but I knew it was toxic. Toxic to the land, 
and toxic to plants and our wildlife. I was appalled. I had never seen anything like that. So I view broom as toxic. It destroys the habitat and plants the wildlife that I want as a legacy to the people that come behind me. I'm concerned about pesticide, was a real cheerleader for the health of people. But in my view, at this time in my life, we waited too long. We don't have an easy answer right now. Pulling, I've done my broom pulling. I did it wrong for years. Finally learned how to do it right. But it's an ongoing, never-ending process. That's what I've discovered. I've gone with volunteer groups, and they don't last very long. The energy is there, and everybody feels good. And then it sort of dissipates. Education has not been the answer. We've simply waited too long. So where did I, where do we, what do we do? What are the solutions at this point? I'm not sure. I admire the uh, MMWD and what they've done. But I've got a couple of thoughts about what you might do. And that is, I, oh, that yellow thing is coming up. That means I'm very short here. OK, I hope you'll consider working more closely with other agencies. County Department of Public Works is doing things, and they should be working more closely with their open space within the county. Both of those agencies should be working with MMWD. San Gerardo Ridge is five miles long, 1,600 acres of Gary Jack Mini Open Space Preserve on one side, MMWD on the other side. We should be working together. And we can do pulling, we can do all kinds of other uh, things. I see I might stop thing here. Yeah. But I, I do want to keep our land safe for people, but I want to keep it safe for plants and wildlife too. My name is William Rothman. I live at 14 Cliff Road in Belvedere. I've been very stimulated by what I've heard. There are two points that I'd like to make that address some of the things that have been said. One is MMWD has been congratulated for the great works it's done in this area. Do you know what percentage of the budget they're spending on vegetation management? Do you think it's 20% of their budget? Maybe 15%? No, it's 1%. 1% of their budget is being spent on vegetation management. So I love to love people, but I don't think credit should be given where credit is not due. The second thing is for those people who love to hike in the water district, the MMWD commissioned a study by Dr. Wang of UC Davis to find out how long Roundup stayed around on vegetation after it was sprayed. Here's what they found. And Director Russell certainly is aware of this, and Mr. Cronin, etc. I'm sorry, I'm going to be done. No, I'm just saying they're aware of it. So what they found was that it remained on the vegetation where it was sprayed at full strength, exactly the same concentration as the day it was sprayed, the same concentration for 88 days, and then they stopped the testing. We usually think of half-life of pesticides, where half is gone. None was gone after three months. For all we know, it may be 88 <laughs> weeks instead of 88 days. So when you think about hiking, picnicking, sitting down with your children in the water district, you may very well, if they use glyphosate, you may very well find yourself picnicking on glyphosate. Thank you. On, on behalf of the district, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. We've heard some great comments that will help us shape the EIR. The comment period is open until November 3rd, uh, or November, December 3rd, I, forgive me, uh, which is about another two weeks or so. Uh, so I encourage all of you who have additional comments that you want to submit to us to do it either in writing or via email. I recognize some of the names this evening from some of you who've already submitted emails, to which I say thank you. Uh, and I think that's it. I think that's a wrap. I don't know if Tom's. Just want to especially thank the crowd for maintaining civil discourse. I've been in several meetings in this building with MMWD where it was much different. So I, I appreciate it, and I thank you very much.